Hello everyone, my name is Cole, and welcome back to How to Design Levels for Video Games. In the last episode, we primarily talked about the main steps involved in creating levels, all the way from the initial concepting phase, all the way to implementing the level into the game. We also spent some time covering some important terminology involved with level design, such as the definition and purpose of levels, and the difference between linear and nonlinear design. In this episode of the series, we will be discussing the principles of level design. The really exciting thing about level design is that there is no limit to the amount of possibilities there are. However, you can't just throw a bunch of ideas at the wall and expect them all to stick. It's very easy to make a bad level if you don't know what makes a level good, which is why it's a great idea to familiarize yourself with some common principles and concepts that level designers like to make use of while they're designing their levels. Now, I should preface this by saying that most people are going to have vastly different ideas of what makes a level good. A lot of it's really subjective, and you may have your own idea about what the principles of level design are, especially considering how different the approach to design can be depending on the type of game you're working on. I highly encourage you to follow whatever principles you think are necessary in order to create the type of levels you need. For this video, I simply want to discuss what I would personally regard as 12 fundamental elements of creating exciting, well-rounded levels for players to experience, and I hope this will help you out in one way or another. Here we go! What is the general feel of your level? The feeling of moving through it, to be more precise. For example, do you want your level to feel simple to navigate, or complex? Do you want it to be snappy and quick to move around in, or slow and methodical? Linear or non-linear? Carefully considering how you want the flow to be executed will heighten your level's immersion and can inspire different emotions in your players. For example, having a dramatic lead-up to the entrance of a large castle will slow the pace of the level down, but drastically increase the tension and drama of it. Or having a section in your level where you quickly leap across the rooftops of buildings will create a very exhilarating, action-packed feeling where the player doesn't really need to slow down and think about what they're doing. They just have to go for it. It's all determined by the purpose of your level and what it is trying to achieve based on the gameplay, story, and atmosphere. You're going to want to think about what flow you want to try and achieve early on during the concepting and prototyping phase, but in reality it often emerges much later on such as when you're playtesting the game. A lot of the time, you'll end up with an unintentional flow to your level that ends up working better than the one you envisioned. Gates are things that, in one form or another, block a player's progress through a level. There are two distinct parts of a gate, the gate itself and the conditions to unlock it. A very obvious example would be a locked door and a key to unlock it. It's important that a level does a good job of establishing and communicating these things. The player needs to be able to easily understand that the locked door is blocking their progress, and the key is their means of progressing. When you're implementing gates into your levels, one useful tip that I can recommend is that you establish the gate before the condition. This way you can ensure that the player can easily understand what must be done to unlock it. So simply put, introduce the goal first, then get the player to find out how to achieve it. One thing that can make a level feel extra memorable to the player is to have it introduce a brand new mechanic. But in order to do this well, it needs to follow the process of teach-test-challenge. First, the game teaches the player how the mechanic works. Then it has them test out the mechanic in different ways so that they understand how it's used. And finally, it challenges their understanding of it by having them use the mechanic in increasingly complex ways throughout the level. Start small, and gradually ramp up the challenge. It's very rewarding for the player when a new gameplay element clicks for them. Balance in video games is when the player's strengths are proportional to other elements of the game to prevent them from being at too much of an advantage or disadvantage. You have to be careful to balance the difficulties so that it feels fair to both the player and the game. Unbalanced difficulty would be putting the player up against a bunch of super tough enemies all at once, 
or inversely making the enemies too weak, which causes the player to have a severe advantage over the game. Of course, depending on the type of game you're making, you might deliberately choose to make it easier or harder, but that's why balancing is important. So when you're designing the difficulty of your level, carefully balance it so that it revolves around the player's skills, instead of arbitrary factors that make the game harder or easier. Use of space is fairly self-explanatory. The level uses its space effectively and valuably. Proper use of space in a level can be a tricky thing to balance properly. It's a given that no matter what, the level should never feel empty. When there's nothing of interest to keep the player's attention, the level can be incredibly boring and will ruin any engagement that the player might have with it. But at the same time, it is important to make sure that you give the space enough room to breathe. Otherwise, the level might feel claustrophobic, and it will come off as poorly designed. Striking a balance can be challenging, but it really pays off. This is really where your metrics come in handy. By being aware of the proper sizing of everything, you can tell when your level is too cramped or too empty. Safe zones are areas throughout your level where the player is able to protect themselves from danger. When you have a danger zone in your level, it's considered to be good practice to design ways in which the player can use the environment around them to their advantage. Try to place spots around the level where players can hide from enemies, cover themselves from attacks, and just avoid danger in general. Smartly placing these throughout your levels can go a long way in improving their design. Rewards are what are given to players for completing a task or objective in a level. Players should be fairly rewarded for their actions. Consider the effort that went into receiving the award. Did the player have to solve a difficult puzzle? Did they have to go out of their way to explore hidden areas? Did they have to defeat a couple simple enemies? No matter what they had to do, they should always be rewarded with something of equal value. This does a lot to make the player feel accomplished and satisfied when playing your levels. If they receive something underwhelming, it can feel cheap and come off as a waste of effort. Loops are ways in which levels lead back into themselves. A truly excellent level will consider ways to reduce the tedium of navigating it. For example, if a level is designed with lots of backtracking, it should include loops that alleviate the frustration of going back and forth. Should the player make enough progress through the level, they should be able to open up loops that allow for quicker backtracking to earlier parts of the level. An example would be in a vertically oriented level, where if the player climbs high enough, they can kick down a ladder that lets them climb back to where they were earlier. Implementing these carefully saves lots of unnecessary headache for the player and creates more intricate level designs. Signposts are visual or auditory cues that direct the player towards something. They can come in many different forms, including having a literal arrow pointing where to go, a breadcrumb trail that leads the player in the right direction, or a sound that gets progressively louder to guide the player towards something. It's important that levels implement these smartly so that players don't get incredibly lost or misguided, which can lead to frustration. Also, be careful not to make your signposts completely overbearing, because players often don't like to be told exactly what to do or where to go. You have to be very smart about how you implement them. Visual hierarchy basically just means that you need to make the most important parts of your level stand out more than the rest. If there are any particular points of interest in your level, make sure that it's clearly visible and stands out. If it looks totally ordinary, there's no reason for the player to assume that it's important because, well, it doesn't exactly look interesting, does it? Think about what you can do to highlight these areas so that this doesn't happen. In video games, a leap of faith refers to the player not having the sense when there is imminent danger. One aspect of level design that I'm sure anyone can recognize as bad design is when the player gets punished for not being able to avoid something that they can't even see. It's not fun for the player to walk into a room and then get ambushed by enemies or traps out of nowhere. 
If you're designing a level full of danger or surprise encounters, the player should be able to anticipate them somehow and proceed with caution. This doesn't mean that they need to be super obviously telegraphed, but the player should have a fair chance against these threats. Soft locks refer to a game state where the game is still seemingly playable, but the player has trapped themselves with no means to progress further. An example would be if the player used an item that is required to progress at the wrong time, and when they reach the point where they're supposed to use it, they can't do anything. Making sure that your levels are free of soft locks is an absolute necessity. There's a reason why they're so rare to find in games. Developers need to spend lots of time testing their levels to find soft locks and then create solutions for them. As such, be wary of these during the testing and revisions phase of level design. So that's my overview of the principles of level design. To summarize, we talked about flow, gating, teach test challenge, balancing, use of space, safe zones, rewards, loops, signposting, highlighting points of interest, avoiding the leap of faith, and avoiding soft locks. Hopefully keeping these principles in mind when you are creating your levels will help you to make them exceptionally well designed. Later in the series, we'll continue to talk about them. In particular, we'll use them as a way to determine design flaws that exist within our levels. I have chosen to design specific parts of my Zelda dungeon around these principles as a way of demonstrating each of them and to help give you all an idea of how they can be incorporated into level design. And so with that, we've gone over everything that I wanted to talk about for this episode. Next time, we're finally going to make the jump into the concepting phase and learn about how we can go about deciding on the initial ideas for a level concept. And you'll get to see what I did for creating the concept of my Zelda dungeon. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.